Hello, it's Saltcast time again, and today we want to start another topic. Because while I was sitting on the last Saltcast episode and thinking about what I could talk about and what I would bring for information to you, I was getting curious about all the creatures we have to fight against in the Black Sword. So my idea is to talk about all the creatures and the historical development, something like that. If you are curious, I'd like you to listen to what I have said to say. And if you aren't, stop the podcast right now. So, please, welcome to our today episode about fascinating mythical creatures. Today we are going to delve deep into the mysterious world of Ah, not so fast. Maybe you'll figure out yourself. I'll tell you about the origins of these mystical creatures. I also have some interesting anecdotes for you. Make yourself comfortable and let yourself be carried away into the world of fairy tales and legends. They are called Leprechaun, Brownies, Luta. Tomte, Nisse, Duende, Folletto, Domovoi, or Tsashiki Varashi. Do you already know? Of course, today it's about the goblin. Today we are talking about the German word Kobold, which is often translated, wrong in my opinion, into English as goblin. I'll try to make the story as understandable as possible for you. Let's start with the origins of the goblins. The term Kobold comes from German and has been known since the Middle Ages. Goblins are small, mischievous creatures that live in houses, stables and mines. They are often invisible, but sometimes they appear in human form or as animals. Goblins are known for doing good as well as playing pranks. Their stories and characteristics vary by region. The origins of goblins can be traced back to the pre-Christian religions and myths of the Germanic and Celtic peoples. They were considered to be protective spirits who guarded the house and livestock, but also tricky creatures who played tricks on people if they didn't follow certain rules. These little spirits were often seen as helpful but mischievous residents of the house who protected the home but could also cause disorder if they felt neglected. Some believe that the name Kobold comes from the old Germanic word Kuba Walda, which means house guard. These little spirits had a dual role. They could act as the useful helpers who kept the house clean and performed small jobs, or as malicious troublemakers who caused disorder if they were not treated respectfully. Other sources say that the word Kobold is made up of the words Kobe, That's what people used to call a house. Even today, many still refer to a pixty as a coben and hold, which means something like liking something or someone in particular. Or is the root the Latin cobalos, which means something like mountain spirit? The Greeks also have their cobalos, which is what a rogue or mischievous fellow is called. Maybe just a mixture of all these? Decide for yourself what you like best. Goblins don't grow bigger than a two-year-old child. They tend to stay smaller and more delicate. They are usually very old, but their face can have the features of a small child or an old man. In any case, they are always male and have a mischievous look on their face. They don't always pay attention to the clothing, and so it can happen that they wear old, frayed clothes. A special feature is their long pointed ears, which they need because they don't miss anything. Goblins also like to wear funny hats, which show off their sometimes green or red hair particularly well. In general, a goblin's face is a very special feature. He can have a particularly large or funny nose, and his mouth also has different shapes. The eyes of all of them flash out of their faces in a funny and cheeky way and are also notably ably large. 
now to one of the most well-known German legions, the Heinzelmännchen of Cologne. These small helpful creatures are said to have helped the citizens of Cologne with their work at night, so that they would find everything ready in the morning. It is said that a long time ago the citizens of Cologne had a lot of work to do every night. The Heinzelmännchen, who remained unnoticed, did this work in the dark. The baker found his bread rolls baked, the shoemaker his shoes finished and the tailor has clothes sewn. The city flourished and everyone benefited from the invisible help. One day, however, the curious wife of a tailor became suspicious. She could not believe that all this work was done by themselves and was keen to see the Heinzelmännchen. She scattered peas on the stairs in the hope that the little helpers would stumble and show themselves. When the Heinzelmännchen came at night, they actually fell down and were so annoyed that they left the city forever. Since then, the people of Cologne had to do their work themselves again and the city's productivity decreased. In fact, the story was only passed down orally for many centuries. It was not until 1824 that the poet Ernst Weiden was inspired to write a ballad about it. For the first time, there was a written document about the Heinzelmännchen from the Siebengebirge. That's where the legion originated and was passed on from generation to generation, which the author conveniently simply moved to Cologne. From this ballad, the poet August Kopisch in 1836 made the following poem, a kind of ballad reloaded. Incidentally, August Kopisch never visited Cologne himself, just as the Heinzelmännchen probably never visited Cologne. And this is what the poem sounds like. How things were so easy in Cologne before, with Heinzelmännchen we asked for no more. If you were lazy, you just take a nap, lie on the bench, no work in your lap. For at night they'd come, when all was still and dumb. Those little men would swarm, and with noise and storm, would pull and tuck and jump and run and clean and scrub. And before a lazy soul awoke, their daily walk already spoke. The carpenters stretched out on shavings to rest. Meanwhile, the spirits would do their best. They saw what needed to be made, took chisel and axe and saw without delay. They sawed and they cut and they hammered and struck. They shaped and kept, survived like hawks and set up the box. Before the carpenter knew, clapped the house, stood there, true. No need for the baker to fret. The Heinzelmännchen baked without a let. The lazy boys would sleep where the little men could creep. And struggled with heavy sacks and kneaded and weighed to the max. They lifted and shifted, they swept and baked. They beat and raked while the boys snored away. The new bread was on display. At the butcher's it was just the same. Journeyman and apprentice in slumber came. Meanwhile the little men would hack the swine, could it crossways fine and fine. They worked so fast like a mill's blast. They chopped with cheevers, carved out with levers. They cleaned, they schemed, they mixed and they mashed, they stuffed and they dashed. When the journeyman opened his eyes, wham! Sausages hung for sale with price. In the tavern, oh how it went, the cooper drank till his strength was spent. He slept against the hollow cask, the little men would do the task. They'd sulfur the casks with delicate flasks, and rolled and lifted with pulleys and shifted, they swirled and twirled, and poured and brewed, and blended and stewed, before the cooper woke anew, the wine was fine, fresh and true. Once a tailor had a great plight, the state coat must be finished right, he tossed the cloth and lay in bed, the, to rest his tired very head. They slipped in quick to the tailor's trick. They cut and moved and sewed and stitched. They fitted and sweated. They pressed and peered and tucked and steered. Before the tailor had awoke, the major's coat already bespoke. The tailor's wife was curious indeed. She played a trick for her need. She scattered peas the very next night. The Heinzelmännchen came inside, one tripped and fell, rolled through the dell. They slid from stairs and tumbled in pairs, they crashed with a smash, 
They cried and they cursed, their anger burst. She rushed downstairs with light and gleam, hush, 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 they vanished like a dream. Alas, now they are all gone, and none are here at dawn. No longer can we rest in peace, now we must do all with our own peace. Everyone must now be diligent and how, and scrape and scrub and run and plot and polish and finish and knock and chop, and cook and bake non-stop. Oh, that it were like before, oh dear, but those good times will never come near. What could have been the true origin of the story? One source says the following. In the past, devices that people used to transport water out of mining pits were called Heinzel. It is possible that the people who did this were called Heinzel Männer. That would also explain their size. At that time, only very small people or children could get into the low mining shafts. However, the Heinzel Männchen became unemployed after pumps were invented for this purpose around the year 1500. Allegedly, they then worked secretly and illegally at night at Cologne companies without being officially registered. So the legend would be a memory of people who lived under undignified conditions. According to the German dictionary of the Brothers Grimm, the term comes from the verb Heinzen, which means something like carrying and helping. However, if you search for Heinzen, you will find out that Heinzen are wooden frames for drying grass. In some places they are also called Heumännchen. Heumännchen is equal to Heinzelmännchen. Hmm. What does all this have to do with goblins? I found something about that too. Hinzelmann is the name for a goblin as a legendary figure. He is said to have done good things such as doing housework. But he could also become evil if you provoked him. Hinzelmann appeared without a figure and had the voice of a child. His home is said to have been in the Bohemian mountains. He entered with the world of legends primarily through his activities in Hudemühlen Castle in Hodenhagen from 1584 to 1588. In 1588 he voluntarily left Hudemühlen and then settled in Eistrup. According to legend, Hinzelmann will return if three conditions are met at the same time. If the cook fills a broken water bucket with a broken ladle, if the duck's hound gives birth under a willow tree, and if a child is born with only one eye. However, because the castle was demolished in the 19th century, a return seems rather unlikely to me. Now let's go to the stories of the Altenberg Goblin. Altenberg is a small town known for its medieval castle and the surrounding forests. The Altenberg Goblin, also known as the Alteberg Heinzel, lived in the castle and played all sorts of pranks at night. But like the elves, he also helped with nighttime work and made sure that the castle remained in good condition. One of the most famous stories is about the old mill on the outskirts of town. The miller was a hard-hearted man who treated his workers badly. One night the goblin decided to punish him. Every night the goblin made the mill's grinding mechanism faster and made the floor disappear in the morning. The miller was at loss and desperate because he could no longer supply his customers. Only when the miller realized his mistakes and treated his workers better did the haunting stop and the goblin restored the floor. Another story tells of the missing keys in the castle. The lady of the castle could not find the key to an important chest. The goblin hid the key in a different place every night until the lady of the castle promised to reward the finder. One morning she found the key under her pillow and the goblin received a bowl of milk and bread as thanks. This gesture showed that the goblin was not just a troublemaker but also valued respect and reward. The goblin also helped children who got lost in the forest. Parents told their children that the goblin would show them the way home and indeed some children reported seeing a small shadowy figure showing them the way. These stories spread quickly and the goblin was worshipped as a guardian spirit and helper of the town of Altenberg. The stories about goblins teach us that justice and kindness are rewarded, while injustice and greed are punished. Goblins, though mischievous creatures, help people become better and protected the weak and helpless. Here are some well-known goblin tales from different parts of Germany and the world. 
In Germany, the Aufhocker is a goblin-like pressure spirit from mythology that jumps on hikers' backs at night, growing heavier with each step. The hiker feels paralyzed and oppressed, unable to turn around. The Aufhocker stays on him until light, a prayer or a bell ringing releases him. The Aufhocken experience often takes place in three phases. First, the hiker is accompanied by an eerie creature, then this creature grows to supernatural size and finally jumps onto the victim's back. Similar creatures are the Hackestüb of Düren, which initially disguises itself as a small dog and then becomes heavier, and the Aachen Backauf, which frightens drunken men and asks them to carry it. Typical places for encounters are streams, bridges, lakes and forests. The Aufhocker can also appear as an old woman, animal figure or elemental being. The oppressive feeling of the situation is important, not the shape of the Aufhocker. The belief in the Aufhocker originally comes from the fear of revenants or undead who steal life force, similar to early vampires. In Western Germany, the Aufhocker is often combined with a werewolf to form the Stüpp, a dangerous monster that jumps on people and stays on them until they die of exhaustion. Two, we have the Booger or Booger Man. He is a legendary figure, a goblin and a child-scaring figure from the Sudetenland. The Booger is described as a demon who is said to kidnap small children when they are disobedient, disobedient or naughty. The black man has no face and covers his head and body in a white cloak. At night he sneaks into the houses of children who are no longer protected by the good spirits because of their rebelliousness, puts them in a large sack and abducts them. When selecting his victims, he is accompanied by his partner, Popelhole, who often tests the children in a final test to see whether they are good or evil at heart. They live together in the swamps near Lilava, where the Booger shows his other peculiarities. According to legend, farmers near the swamps reported that the veined Booger spent most of his time sitting on a dam combing his hair, especially after a storm. But when adults approached him, he immediately disappeared without a trace. As soon as he wasn't taking care of his hair, he danced happily with his companion or alone, which, despite his cruelty, earned him the reputation of being an actually happy goblin in some stories. Dance, dance, boogerman around our bay. If it wasn't the boogerman, I'd give some bucks away. In a newer version of the legend, there are a whole series of boogerman who met on the booger hill after their raids and danced together. The name Booger probably comes from the Polish ruler Popiel II. He was considered particularly cruel, met a violent death and, according to legend, was eaten by mice. According to another theory, the term comes from the Silesian dialect. Here, picking means to cover something up. A Booger or Bali Booger is a covered scarecrow. Where there's a man, there's usually also a male. In our case, the Poplitzer Popelmännchen. That's what the house spirit of Poplitz Castle is called. Bernhard Friedrich von Grosig lived from 1656 to 1714. He had Poplitz Castle built on the foundations of an older building. From the previous building, he had a cornerstone with a strange stone figure, popularly known as the Popelmännchen, inserted into the northeast corner of his castle at a height of about 6 meters. According to legend, the construction of the castle was significantly hampered by a goblin who every night partially destroyed the work of the day. Finally, a man dressed in a robe advised the builder to dedicate part of the building as a chapel in order to put an end to the mischief. After this had happened and the goblin appeared again, he was hurled high against the corner pillar by an invisible force and turned into stone. All attempts to remove this strange figure out of a climbing cat failed. But the construction work now progressed quickly. 
at midnight, the goblin enchanted in stone descends and wanders through poplets at the witching hour in the form of a small grey man with fiery eyes and short, crooked legs. In Marvel comics, there are several characters known as goblins, including the Green Goblin and the Hobgoblin. These characters are primarily associated with Spider-Man and have their origins in the 1960s and 1980s. The Green Goblin had his first appearance in Amazing Spider-Man number 14 in July 1964, and the Hobgoblin had his first appearance in The Amazing Spider-Man number 238 in March 1983. The creation of the Green Goblin and the Hobgoblin has had a lasting impact on the Marvel Universe, and Spider-Man stories in particular. Both characters are deeply rooted in Spider-Man's history and mythology and have made numerous appearances in various media, including animated series, films and video games. And this connection to chemistry still exists. Cobalt ores and cobalt compounds have been known for a long time and were used as cobalt blue mainly to color glass and ceramics. In the Middle Ages they were often thought to be valuable silver and copper ores. However, since they would not be processed and gave off bad smells when heated due to the arsenic content, they were considered to be bewitched. Goblins were said to have eaten the precious silver and excreted less valuable silver-colored ores in its place. In addition to cobalt, these also included tungsten and nickel ores. The miners then gave these ores derivative names such as nickel, tungsten and goblin ore. In 1735, the Swedish chemist Georg Brandt discovered the previously unknown metal while processing cobalt ores, described its properties and gave it its current name. In 1780, Torben Olaf Bergmann discovered that cobalt is an element when he examined its properties in one more detail. Oh, I almost forgot this fabulous vacuum cleaner called Cobalt from a German manufacturer, which, by the way, has been around for almost 95 years. The story is not so spectacular. It looks like a goblin, the chief designer secretary is said to have exclaimed when she saw this device for the first time. That's it for today. I can't say anything more about goblins, all without guarantee of accuracy and even completeness. I hope you enjoyed the stories about goblins. If you want to find out more about the fascinating world of fairy tales, stay tuned and don't miss the next episodes. Until next time, stay curious and goodbye. All the best. See you soon. Your Spencer.